we're starting a brand new way of teaching at the feast. We're starting something exciting. God is birthing a whole new generation of people who will hunger to follow the word. By book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, story by story. We're gonna sit at the master's feet with total humility and allow the text as divinely inspired to speak to our hearts. Get ready because we're gonna start this journey of longing and really understanding God and His Word for you. Hi everybody, welcome to another powerful Feast at Home session. We are so delighted and so glad that you're here to join us. I hope that you are ready for your tanks to be filled up because we don't ever want to take for granted, you know, the time we spend with you because we understand that for some of you, this might be the only time that you get to hear God's Word all week long. And so we're always praying that the message would be good enough to give you a good start for the week. Let's begin with talk three of miracles and more. As you all know, we are studying the book of Matthew and you know what? It is slowly changing our life. Amen. And if you're ready, I'm sure I am ready. Let's all say our favorite family prayer at the feast as we all come in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Everybody join me in saying this as you lift your hands in the air. Today, I receive all of God's love for me. Today, I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today, I open myself to God's blessings, healing, and miracles. Today, I open myself to God's word so that I become more like Jesus every day. Today, I proclaim that I'm God's beloved. I am God's servant, and I am God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world in Jesus' name, amen. Everybody, please stretch your hands towards the screen as we give honor to God's word by singing, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Today we are on talk three of miracles and more. And just a quick recap for those of you who were not able to follow. Talk one was make me clean. That's right. And then talk two, make me believe. And today, here's our talk title, make me follow. Make me follow. Go ahead and write that one down. But anyway, let me ask you this very important question, okay? Have you heard God's calling in your life? Do you hear God calling you? I actually believe that not everybody can relate to this question. Why? Simply because there are people who think that only certain people can hear God's call. And we refer to those people as religious professionals like the priests and the nuns and the pastors. But people think that this question is not applicable to everyone. Like for example, BPO workers, no, not applicable to you. Or insurance brokers, not applicable. Or dentists or IT experts or janitors or or accountants or carpenters or athletes. We think that it's not applicable to everyone, but let me break this fallacy for you, okay? No matter who you are or what you do in life, God is calling you. That's right. So let me ask you again, have you heard God's calling in your life? Or maybe your line is always busy. Or worse, you just don't want to pick up the call. That's actually the story of my life. You know, I heard God's calling early in life as early as a teenager. But you know what? I was too busy with so many other things that I did not answer his calling until I was 27 years old. All because there was a lot of noise. You see, my dear friends, noise 
drowns out God's voice. God might be calling, but if there are too many party lines in your life, you might not receive the call. How many of you remember what a party line was? Come on, show of hands right now, virtual hands. If you remember what a party line was, make yourself heard. I want to give a shout out to all the titos and the titas who are raising their hands right now and all the lolos and the lolas who can relate to this. But to our young audience, okay, let me explain. A party line is not a hotline number that people would call in order to have a party, okay? That's not what it was. Back in the day, before the time of smartphones, we actually used an invention called a landline phone to call people. It's the little black device or other kinds of colors that came with the wire. I don't know if you've seen those in Google. But anyway, because telephone lines were not as prevalent in certain areas, you know, some of us actually had to share a telephone number with someone else, like a neighbor or another another family. So it was like one telephone number for two families, all right? Hashtag the struggle was real. So whenever someone would call looking for your neighbor, you know what you would have to do? You would have to say, oh, can you please dial again so that they would answer. That's how the party line worked, okay? Little confession. We actually had and shared our line with someone else in the neighbor. We had a party line with someone else, okay? And whenever I would expect a very important phone call, you know, a life-altering phone call, such as that as my girlfriend at that time, okay? Whenever someone would call looking for someone else in the other house, I would casually tell them and say, ah, sorry po, pero he's still pooping. Can you please call back again later? <laughs> this is a time when I was before I was saved by the Lord, okay? And the reason why I am sharing this is because, yes, you can miss God's calling because there's a lot of noise in your life. But sometimes you can also miss God's calling simply because there are people who will distract and discourage you from answering it, okay? People who will say, oh, he's too busy. He, he doesn't have time right now. Anyway, let's go to our key passage. If you brought your Bible with you, please turn to Matthew chapter 8, verse 14, where Jesus heals many people. We're going to divide this into two parts, okay? Here's the first part. It says in verse 14, When Jesus arrived at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. So you see, yes, Peter actually had a mother-in-law. So that means that the first pope had a wife. You know, celibacy became a priestly discipline only 1,100 years later. And then it says here in verse 15, But when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her. Then she got up and prepared a meal for him. Verse 16, That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out the evil spirits with a simple command, and then he healed all the sick. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah who said he took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. And then here's the second part, okay? Verse 18, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he instructed his disciples to cross to the other side of the lake. Then one of the teachers of religious law said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. And then another of his disciples said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me now. Let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. This is our verse for today. I believe that God is going to use this to speak to us in the few moments to come. Let's pray, everybody. You can close your eyes, bow down your head. Let me just pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your beautiful word. We thank you for this message that resonates life. We believe it's alive and it's active. And until we, we let it come in and seep into our bones and into our spirits, Lord, it will have little effect on our life. So we ask you, Lord. Let the Holy Spirit speak to us in, in, in a matter of letting us understand your words, Lord. Take it down to the level of our understanding. And we are just so excited because we know that this will change the way we think and the way we feel this week. Thank you so much. We give you the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. One more time, everybody. Help me give glory to the Lord by singing again. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. 
God bless you. I pray that the message that we're going to deliver to do today will bless you. Hi, everybody. God bless you. I am so happy that you have joined us today at the feast, and I'm praying for a miracle for you. You know, that's the series that we're in, Miracles and More, chapter 8 and 9 of the book of, of the Gospel of Matthew, and I'm praying that more miracles will happen in your life. But what kind of miracles? That's what we're talking about. Today, we're talking about the greatest miracle that can ever happen and that is you responding to God's love and you and this is this is my message my message is to go all in that's it go all in if there's somebody beside you right now tell that person tap that person on the shoulder go all in you know but you cannot go all in if your trust is not strong enough deep enough total enough which is something that we're praying for. I'm praying for you that you're able to do it. Let me tell you an old story. 200 years ago, there was this tightrope artist that wanted to do something never done before. On Niagara Falls, he stretched a cable, a long steel cable, 1,100 feet from one side to the other, and he was going to cross it on top of the raging waters. And that's what he did. I want you to know that from the street, a crowd of onlookers were watching this incredible feat. And then from the loudspeakers, the MC said, how many of you believe that this daredevil can actually do it? Cross Niagara Falls. And, and the, the crowd, you know, cheered and shouted, all of them raising their arms, saying, yes, yes, you know, you can do it, you can do it. Wow, it was so wonderful. And then the MC said, okay, because you believe that he can do it, we need one volunteer. He is asking for one volunteer who would ride on his shoulders as he walks the tightrope. And everybody's arms, you know, went down and people began to laugh. Of course, nobody wanted to volunteer. You see, I, I share you that story because it's very easy to say, I believe in God. I believe He's amazing. I believe He's wonderful. He created the universe and He's here and He's good and blah, blah, blah. Law, but wait a minute, Christianity is not about just believing. Christianity is about living and loving and serving and going all in. That's the point which brings us to our reading today. Are you ready? You know, just to give a little background before we actually read the story again, that where, where, is, where is this happening? It's happening, happening in Capernaum. It's happening in the house of Peter. Now, I want you to know that in the three-year public ministry of Jesus, this became like central headquarters for Jesus and his apostles. So they spent a lot of time here. And I can so super relate to central headquarters of a ministry because my parents' house at the early, early years of the light of Jesus family was, you know, our our home was the, this is the headquarters. And Oh, man, like every day, uh, you know, every night was filled from prayer meetings to music ministry practice to, uh, uh, you know, there was like a planning for this and there was a birthday party for one of our members and th there were so many things happening and there was zero privacy. It was very noisy. It was always messy, but that was not my mom's biggest problem. Perhaps you're thinking now, what, 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 what? what? The biggest problem of my mom was how to feed hungry people week after week after week. People would go in and go out and, and man, now let's go to Peter's house. I bet the same thing happened. The two women of that house, Peter's wife and Peter's mother-in-law, I bet that was their problem too. How to feed at minimum, 13 hungry men, you know, Jesus and his apostles every day. And then you've got all these other people who wanted to listen to him. Wow! If they had a refrigerator, it would have always been empty. Now, this is where the story begins. I hope you're getting a picture now, a better picture of what happened. Verse 14, when Jesus arrived at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed 
with a high fever. Now, this healing story um, is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in all those times, her name was not mentioned. So let's give her a name for this story, okay? Let's call her Mama B for Bienan, all right? Imagine, walk through Mama B's house, through her door, tired and hungry, and then they hear the news, Mama B had high fever and was lying in bed. And horrors, the food was not ready. Oh no, but hallelujah, the greatest physician of the universe, the greatest doctor of the universe was in the house. And, but Jesus touched her hand and the fever left her. That should have been the climax of the story. And the fever left her, period. But Matthew, the writer, was spotlighting what happened after the healing. Because this is his lesson. What happened? Then she got up and prepared a meal for him. In other versions, it says, she rose and she began to serve him. Friend, this is the end result of every healing story, of every answered prayer, of every miracle received. <laughs> let, me, let me say this. I, I need to preach this to you. You answer his call and serve him. That's the end result. Jesus is the healer of, of the sick. Jesus is the food for the hungry. Jesus is water to the thirsty. Jesus is freedom to those who are in prison. But his most important title is Jesus is Lord. And a lot of people, they relate to Jesus as the one who answers their prayer. Jesus is the one who heals. And Jesus is the one who, who is a miracle worker. But do you relate to him as Jesus Lord? Do you actually follow him? Are you all in? You can't be half-half when it comes to Jesus. Some people are. Some people just relate to Jesus when they need something from Him. And, you know, oh God, there's an emergency. Oh Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. But when Jesus says, I need you, are you all in? <laughs> and, and I know it's a radical word. It's a radical message. Hey, wake up. This is what it is. So one day at the feast, there was this man. He came up to me. And he, he, was, he was shaken, so super shaken. He told me that his doctors told him that he had cancer. And for many people, that is a wake-up call. It's like, it's like a cathartic, you know, when, when you realize that your, your time is running out. And so I, I prayed for him. I, I prayed over him. He was sobbing like a baby. And, you know, from his own lips, he said that he was not living a good life. He, was, he had a drinking problem. He was, he was far from God. He, he, had a, he was womanizing. He was gambling. You know, you name it, he was doing it. And, and so I said, you know, now's the time to turn to the Lord. So, so give your life to Him. Keep on attending the feast. So I saw him. I saw him and his wife. They were there every single week. And then I, I, I heard from the wife that, the, you know, his, he was changing. He, was, he stopped his drinking. He attended a marriage retreat with his wife. So this was, a, this was somebody who was womanizing before and he didn't value his marriage. Now he was working on his marriage. His wife also told me that he was working on his relationship with his children, which was strained before. But now he was repairing it. It was like he was overhauling his life. And week after week, I saw him at the feast. Four months later, you know, he came up to me. He, you, you could see in his face, he was just giddy with excitement. And he said, Brother Bo, my medical tests show, you know, that doctors cannot find a trace of cancer in my body. I am healed. And he was so super happy. At that, on that spot, you know, I, I held his hand. We prayed a prayer of gratitude. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And so, uh, wow. Like, like a happy ending, right? Um, not so. Not so. In fact, it, it ended in a, in a way that I, I did not expect. And I, it's really sad. Because uh, as the weeks went by, I, I would see him and then I would not see him and then I would see him and then I would not see him. And the, more and the longer it went, I, I did not see him. I would just see his wife. And then on, in, one day in the hallway, 
at the feast, I saw him and I said, hi, hi. And then he was very apologetic, said, you know, it was so busy, he said, and his job was taking him away and he could not be very regular. I said, that's fine, that's fine, that's okay. But then soon I did, I did not see him anymore. I didn't. And then one day, uh, his wife came up to me and she said, Brother Bo, the cancer came back. And um, the thing was this, he, his life, at a certain point, he went back into his old life. He went back into drinking. He went back into womanizing. He went back. And three months later, he was gone. Um, I, I was, my You see, he was blessed. He was healed by God. And my, my message to you today is that we should never waste a blessing. I, I, I really believe that. You know, don't be content with receiving the healing. Don't be content receiving a miracle. God wants to give you something more. And what would that be? He wants to give you a call. Every blessing is a call to serve the blesser. Let me say that again, just in case you didn't get that. Every blessing is a call to serve the blesser. Because God cannot be that golden cat with a swinging arm that calls for good luck. God cannot just be the unthing and thing that protects you from evil. God cannot just be oh, that, that big Buddha where you rub the belly for good luck and for... God's not just that. You know, God is not just blessing you and He wants to answer your prayer. And he wants to... No, there's an end result. And Matthew was bringing that out. It's every blessing is a call to... Are you blessed? Are you blessed? If you are blessed, then this is it. You've, you've got to make a decision and say, it's, it's a call. Every blessing, it's a call to serve the blesser. You know, when people walk to the feast, go into the feast for the first time, we give them a novena to God's love. And we tell people, you know, write your seven dreams. And what dreams do people write? You know, the normal ones that everybody has, you know, I want to have a new job. I want to have a better job. I want to have a car. I want to have a, a house. I, I want to have, you know, they, they, they write it out. I want to have a new boyfriend. <laughs> write them down. They, they, and, and they do. But then this is what I notice. Now, the, the reason people ask me, why do we start with that? I start with that because that's where God starts. People have needs and people are sick and people have need. You know, they, they have dreams. And so we start with that. God takes people where they are. And by the way, many Filipinos don't know how to dream anymore. They've, they've been crushed by their life and their hopes are gone. So we, we teach people how, how to dream again. But, but this is this is thing. Christ, your relationship with Jesus is a journey. It starts somewhere, but it needs to end somewhere. And this is what I've noticed. That a transformation happens. Yes, they start to dream and they start to dream again. And they've got these, these dreams for their lives. But then they get to know Jesus at the feast. And they get to know him more. And then Jesus calls them, are you going all in and when they say yes something happens all of a sudden the dreams that they have they 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 bring it before the lord now and they surrender them to him because they realize that god is more important than all their dreams and now their prayer is not anymore lord make my dreams come true make my dreams come true now they go to god and say lord make your dreams come true through me and and they begin to something happens something so beautiful instead of saying lord god make me rich they're 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 now praying lord um help me 
make others rich. If you know your blessings, let it flow through me. Suddenly, they're dethroned from the throne. God sits on the throne, and they go all in. <laughs> I pray that God is speaking to you. The story's not yet over. Keep listening. Thank you so much, Brother Bo. I hope that all of our viewers are really learning a lot today. But let's continue the story, okay? It's just so good. After Jesus heals Mama B, it says that he conducted an evening rally, okay? It says here in Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, that evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus and he cast out the evil spirits with a simple command and he healed all the sick. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah who said he took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. You know, this verse says that Jesus had now gained and caught the attention of many people and they were now going to him for healing. But you know what? There were some people who were so amazed at the healing power of Jesus that they immediately wanted to follow him. In fact, Matthew says that there were two guys, two guys who wanted to follow Jesus right after they experienced the miracle. All right, let me read it to you. It says in verse 18, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he instructed his disciples to cross to the other side of the lake. And then verse 19, then one of the teachers of religious law said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. All right. This is one of the guys. And this text says that this guy was a religious professional. Either he was a priest or a pastor or a preacher. And he was saying, Jesus, I love what you're doing. In fact, I want in. Okay. I want to be one of your disciples. That's what he was saying. You know, when you look at the ministry of Jesus on the outside, it would probably look very glamorous, right? Because after all, he was trending. He was gaining followers. And you know what? The people who are not rooted in the right foundation, trending and gaining followers can be a very attractive thing. But you see, to Jesus, this was not a popularity contest, okay? That's why he said in verse 18, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he instructed his disciples to cross to the other side of the lake. You know, this verse implies that Jesus actually wanted to avoid the multitude of people because this is very important for us to understand because although Jesus came into this world to heal us, it wasn't just about healing us, okay? Jesus didn't just want to give us a miracle. No, he wanted to give a message because this wasn't just about winning the approval of people. No, it was about winning souls. Okay, that's what was more important. So this religious uh, teacher probably wanted to have that same appeal as Jesus did, you know, to draw a crowd like Jesus. That's why I'm glad that Jesus corrected this belief by telling us the real score of what it means to follow him. So for everyone who wants to follow Jesus, okay, here's what it means. It says, let's read verse 20. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests. But the son of man has no place to even lay his head. Notice that when the religious teacher asked Jesus if he could follow him, Jesus didn't say, okay, great. You know, welcome aboard. You won't regret it. In fact, here are my disciples' benefits. Okay, number one, you won't ever get hungry. Why? Because I can multiply bread. There's an unlimited supply of alcoholic beverages when you follow me. Why? Because I can transform water into wine, okay? And you are actually going to be covered with the best health insurance that money cannot buy. Why? Because, hello, I am the great healer. That's not what Jesus did, you know? Instead of talking about the benefits, Jesus talked about the burdens. Uh-huh. I love how honest Jesus was because he wasn't like us, you know, who would give a very colorful sales pitch in the hopes that people would buy our products and our services and apply to be in our downline. No, instead, Jesus was real. He wanted people to know the real challenges of following him from the very start by saying that the Son of Man ha uh, has no place even to lay his head. You know, Jesus was saying, if you're willing to follow me, you're going to have to leave your place, okay? Your place of comfort, your place of security, your place of significance, because to Jesus, this world was not his true home. Heaven 
was his true home. You know, this world, he was just passing through. And let me just tell this to you, okay? The same thing goes with you and me. We are all just passing through in this world because God is our one true home. God is our only home. So to everyone who is homesick right now because you are stationed in a different place, you might have migrated to a different country away from your loved ones, okay? May you find comfort in knowing that if God is with you, you are home. This is the first guy, okay? In this story, Jesus is asking you this question today. If you are willing to follow me, here's the question. Can you let go of attachments to worldly and material things, okay? Can you give up the treasures of this world and make Jesus your only treasure? That's the question that Jesus is asking us today, okay? This is the first guy only, all right? Let me read to you about the second guy who wanted to follow Jesus. It says here in verse 21, Another of his disciples said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him in verse 22, Follow me now. Let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Okay? Let me clarify this for a moment. All right? This guy actually did not ask for permission to, to dig a grave for his deceased father. In fact, his father was very much alive. You know? All he wanted was to remain in his father's house and to take care of him until his father died. In other words, he wanted to follow Jesus, but not just yet. Okay, let me ask you this question. How many of you, just by a show of hands, how many of you want to go to heaven? You want to go to heaven? Come on, show of hands. Who wants to go to heaven? Show of hands. But here is a follow-up question, okay? How many of you want to go to heaven now? <laughs> anyway, Jesus says, he says here, this is so beautiful. Jesus says in verse 22, Jesus told him, follow me now. All right? Jesus says to you and me, follow me now, not later, not next week, not next month, not next year, but now. Not when you are in your senior years and you're already waiting for death to come, Jesus says now. Not when you're waiting to graduate, Jesus says now. Not when you're waiting to get married, Jesus says now, okay? Jesus wants you to follow him right this very moment. All right, I hope that this message is preaching to you. But by the way, let me also qualify that last statement because people might say, doesn't this passage make Jesus anti-family? Come on, okay? Read the whole Bible and you will know that Jesus actually loves the family. But the reason why Jesus says this is because he was teaching the principle that Jesus always comes first. All right, family obligations or other obligations should only be secondary to following Jesus, which leads me now to ask you another question, okay? Has an attachment to a person prevented you from following Jesus? Is there a person in your life today, whether it's a loved one, a family member, or a really close friend, that because you are so attached to that person in that relationship, that person might be leading you away from your God? You're no longer obeying, you're no longer following, you're no longer loving Jesus the way that he wants you to. If there is a person like that in your life, let me just preach this to you, okay? I know of a family who actually stopped going to their regular weekly Sunday gatherings at the grandparents' house, all because it coincided and it came into conflict with their weekly schedule in church. All right, with their Sunday service. So they would only st they would still visit on Sundays, but only during special occasions. But then they would still visit on Saturdays. They merely changed the schedule from Sunday to Saturday. But you see, after a while, the siblings started questioning their priorities as a family. And they said, isn't family important to you? And then the father of the family answered by saying, yes, family is important. But you see, our faith is more important. Don't let people pull you away from God. No matter how special that person is, don't compromise your faith just for the sake of the familiar, just for the sake of what's comfortable because following Jesus is not easy. But he said he should always be the priority. You see, my dear friends, Jesus never sugarcoated this at all. He, he, he said that following him is a very serious business. It's like a, a marriage vow. And I remember my own marriage standing in that altar with my wife, Christelle, almost seven years ago. I've said this time and time again that the moment I said I do to her, it also meant I, that I was saying I don't to every other woman out there. You see, this is what it means to follow 
God, to put God first. That when you follow Jesus, you are saying I do to God and you are saying I don't to all the other attachments, both to things and to people because in your heart, God is the most important thing. God should be your only real attachment. Can I get an amen from somebody? Amen. Anyway, I'm about to close right now. Let's go back to that tightrope story that Brother Bo shared earlier, okay? Remember how no one wanted to volunteer when somebody said, who wants to go on top of my shoulders? But nobody did. Actually, there was someone who did. And to everybody's shock, it was a, an eight-year-old girl who raised her hand. And so they brought her to the tightrope artist and then they lifted her up on the man's shoulders and almost immediately the high wire acrobat started walking on the steel cable and then he finally crossed the Niagara Falls. Get this, the entire time that the girl was on the shoulders of that man, she was smiling the whole time. And so after they arrived on the other side, the MC ran to interview her and then he asked, I have so many questions for you little girl. And one, why did you volunteer? Number two, why weren't you afraid? Number three, why were you smiling the whole time? And then this little girl, she smiled from ear to ear and then pointing to the tightrope artist, she said, simple, because he's my dad. It's so easy to say, my dear friends, I believe in God, or God is good, or praise the Lord. But here's the thing, when Jesus heals you, when Jesus saves you, the question is now, will you walk on the tightrope with Jesus? Will you go all in? Will you serve Him to the best of your abilities? You see, Jesus said, it's not easy to follow me. But here's the thing, never ever forget who you are following. You are not following a magician who simply pulls a rabbit out of a hat. No, Jesus is the real deal. Jesus has real power. He's got real miracles. He's got real grace. He's got real mercy. You are following a mountain moving, storm breaking, devil defeating, kingdom building, life changing God. So please go all in my dear friends. Trust in Him. I pray that this message has blessed you in many ways. Let's pray, everybody, as before we come into worship, God. Let's all come in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we thank you for this word. We cannot thank you enough for the ways that you have spoken today. And Father, we pray that our faith would just be deepened, that we would follow you to the ends of the earth, Lord. We believe that it's not easy. But with you, everything is possible. We want to have the faith just like that eight-year-old girl, Lord, who said yes. Who said yes to walking along that tightrope with you, Jesus. And while we are still here on this planet, Lord, while we still have the strength, while we still have the wisdom, while we still have, Lord, the breath in our lungs, we will follow you until the end of our days. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to click the like button and tell people and all your friends and family about the inspiration they can receive here. And remember to subscribe and click the bell icon so that you get notified when we're going to upload the next inspiring video.